Welcome to School of PE Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Miller, and I'm so glad that you could join me this week. We are going to discuss topics about FE, PE, and SE, and we're also going to answer questions that will help students prepare for their exams. Let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the School of PE's weekly SOPE podcast. I'm Chris Miller. we got a returning guest today. Luis is back. Welcome back, Luis. And um, if you could just kind of catch everybody up to, you know, who you are and what you do. Yeah, thanks for having me back. I, I love doing podcasts. I have podcasts on my own. And this is kind of what I love to do, just help other engineers and help them in their careers. I'm a bridge engineer located in Colorado. I've been practicing engineering for four years now. I got my P license last year. And the journey has been great. A lot of struggles coming from a different country. Uh, I've been able to expand my skills, my expertise into other things that I really enjoy doing, like podcasting. I've created some courses and resources for young engineers to hopefully help them in their process as they they want to become a professional engineer. And I think even after that, to continue just learning and progressing their careers. Fantastic. That's exciting stuff. And, and, you know, I always like meeting somebody that likes to kind of give back, right? Help those mm-hmm. that are doing the path that you uh, that you completed. So that, that's pretty cool. So today we have an exciting topic. We're going to be talking about the uh, transition for the PE civil from paper pencil mm-hmm. to the computer based. Um, and also maybe talk about some of the recommended study materials and maybe some pitfalls to avoid. Um, you know, it's a big change, right? Um, yeah. Over the years, NCS has been slowly transitioning other disciplines from paper, pencil to the um, to the computer base. You know, the FE has been like this for many years and then they move with the smaller PEs. Then all of a sudden, bam, man, PE (laughs) civil, the granddaddy of them all is now computer based. So um, let me ask you this, Luis, what did why the change from paper, pencil to CBT? Why even do that? I'm I'm not totally sure why, but I I have a few guesses. one of them just being easier to grade. I think the paper and pencil just takes a lot of time. When I took it last year, it took, I believe, six to seven weeks, sometimes even more for wow. some people right. uh, to get the result. I, th- I think with the computer base, I think you get your results as soon as seven days sometimes. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a lot quicker. Uh, the other benefit, I think, is having it more frequently throughout the year. You don't have to wait until April or October to take it. You can take it one time each quarter and they're numerous times during the quarter you can take it so i think that's a, a big benefit especially with people that may not pass it the first time which i think it's i mean 60 percent pass rate is not, is not very high so there's a lot of people that would like to take it multiple times in a year without having to wait six seven months for the second round um, and i think the last one is just there's a different there's a variety of type of questions now and the way that you go through the exams a little different which may be a good thing and a bad thing in time, as well as just being a closed book exam now. I think we talked about this in the in the last episode we recorded, but you now have just like a handbook where all the information should be there and you, you're able to search and search the codes. Again, that can be a benefit or a drawback depending on how you like to study, how you like to keep your materials mm-hmm. and how you best learn at the end of the day. No, and I'm with you on that. I mean, I think also some of the logistics are gone. You know, you Mm -hmm. used to, it used to take more resources, right? You have to have uh, multiple exam proctors, maybe uh, rent exam halls. So, you know, by using like a Pearson View or Prometric Testing Center, it's a lot easier for candidates to get to these locations. Also, you know, you don't need as many proctors maybe as well. Um, But yeah, it's it's been a big change for sure. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, they freak out, right? I mean, change is scary for anything you do, right? You move to a new, you know, let's say you move from California to Arkansas, you know, it's scary. Change is is a fearful thing. Um, But yeah, you know, it's closed book. You can't take in the suitcase worth of books anymore. So learning how to navigate the NCS reference handbook is key. Um, As you mentioned, you do have access to the codes and standards during the exam. But one of the drawbacks is that, you know, back when it was paper pencil, you could tab everything, right? Yeah. You could you could be like, hey, I know exactly. I go to this blue tab for this code. I go to the orange tab for this code. Um, so that is a whole new ball game for people. So I think, you know, those are some of the scary things for, um, for the PE uh, civil changing. But also I agree, you know, it used to be what, in April, 
in an October test. But yep. now, you know, if you don't pass it in April, you could take it again here in June. So I agree. I think not having to wait those six months is huge, right? I mean, you fall off the horse, you can get back up much quicker than you did in the past. So uh, I think those are great points that you had brought up. Um, another question I have is, it comes to the, what is linear on the fly testing? Yeah, and I had to look this up, and I have a few friends that actually took the exam here in the, net, in the last couple of months. But that basically means is as you answer questions, I think you basically have, depending on either how you answer it or just how the test is programmed, you get different like paths oh. during the exam. And so you always have different, if you're sitting next to another, let's say, civil PE exam next to you, you never really have the same exam. And it's like, you it can change as you start taking the exam. That makes oh, wow. sense. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure if that's actually accurate, but that's kind of what I've heard. And it's a little, it's challenging to think about it when you are in the exam and then uh, depending on how you answer, depending on how the th the test is programmed, you can get different paths within a similar exam. So it's a little confusing. I'm not a hundred percent clear that, but I think that's kind of the, the basis of it. Yeah, it's a pretty good explanation. It, it kind of reminds me of like, you know, for those uh, nurses who are taking the NCLEX exam, they, their mm -hmm. uh, exams are what they call dynamic, right? If you're doing really poor in a section, you get more questions on that particular subject. So it kind of adapts to your performance on the uh, on the exam. Um, so it's yeah. interesting. Um, you know, what do you think some of the pros and cons of it are? I, I think it allows you to maybe recover a little mm -hmm. faster if you get a lot of wrong questions in a row. Um, I think the exam just kind of adjusts depending on how you answer this question. So I really don't see a huge benefit to that other than just being able to maybe have different types of questions as, as you answer them. And maybe you get a lot of good ones in a certain type of question. Maybe you don't get as many in a different type of question, but just kind of that flexibility as you take the exam. That makes sense. That makes sense. So with the introduction or the transition to CBT computer base comes a different types of questions, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning like not different types of questions in the sense that they're qu different questions, but different uh, question types, right? You know, you used to have the multiple choice, right? A through D is a great example, but now they introduced, and these have been introduced on the FE, they are introduced on the other PEs that are computer based, but they call them AITs, alternative item type questions. So how should, let me ask you this, Luis, as you're preparing for the exam and you know that these AITs are going to pop up. And I think at one time it was representative 10% of the exam. So not a whole lot of AIT questions, but how, should you change the way you study and prepare knowing that you're going to be coming across these AIT type questions? I, I think you need to adjust a little bit, but I think this would be great for the people that like to learn visually. So like they like to draw diagrams, like to draw pictures. I think they're going to see these type of questions and immediately just remember what they studied a few months back. So it's understanding kind of the learning style and understanding how you learn best. As engineers, we we are mostly uh, kinesthetic learners. So we like to actually do the work and like mm -hmm. use our hands to do the work and actually see what's happening. But a lot of people are visual learners. A lot of people are better with words and and audio so it's just understanding where you fall into that spectrum and apply that into your learning materials and maybe introduce a little bit of each knowing that there may be questions that are more graphical than others and a way you create that that um visual memory of the type of questions that may be asked during the exam no, that makes sense. That makes sense. You know, it's, it's you know, they and I, there's a great video on the NCS website that walks you through the alternative item types, walks you through the different types of like drag and drop, hotspot, you know, mm -hmm. fill in the blank, things like that. So, you know, I get the pleasure of talking to students every day, whether it's people preparing for their FE, people preparing for their PE. And one of the questions that I've been getting a lot lately is, you know, what kind of advice can you give somebody that's getting ready to take the computer-based format. And, uh, you know, Luis, you've just been through it not too long ago. So can you kind of maybe, let's say if I were coming to you and say, hey, Luis, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to take my PE. It's not a paper pencil anymore. Any advice you can give? I think the, the advice in terms of signing that hasn't really changed from paper and pencil to the CBT is just taking the time to really learn the material. And mm -hmm. I think this comes to, again, allowing that three, four, five months, maybe even six months before you take the exam, 
to really understand the material, study without really rushing it too much, and just have a solid plan as you progress to the exam. I think that's probably the most important part, uh, understanding where your weaknesses are in terms of like what topics you may not remember as much from school, uh, maybe focusing on that a little more. Um, in my case, I actually focused probably 80 to 90% of the time on the depth portion, mm. knowing that there was going to be a lot of questions in the morning section as well. Right. I think total, in terms of actually studying for the morning session, I studied for two weeks, maybe 30 hours or so. And then I did just did a ton of problems, a ton of uh, exams, um, practice uh, after that, that allowed me to just kind of pick up the topics, what kind of questions are going to be there for right. those morning breath questions that... I'm not as familiar, but I know I can look it in the manual, look it in, in another resource. But in the afternoon, the depth portion, I felt pretty confident because I spent, again, 80, 90% of the time starting right. for that section. No, that's some great advice. You know, and I what I tell people too is the exam specs didn't change, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, what they tested you on in last October is no longer what they're testing you on today. So that hasn't changed. So you're right. Your approach should stay the same. Maybe, as you said, become a little bit more familiar with the references that you do have. For example, the NCS reference handbook, you know, you're going to want to become very familiar with that, understanding where certain things are. That way during the exam, you're not spending a lot of time flipping through pages, right? Like, oh man, where's this uh, thing on geometrics, right? Or where's this project planning? So if you can become familiar with the handbook, it saves yourself some time during the exam, which I think is, is very helpful as well, because, you know, essentially it's a race against the clock as well, right? I mean, eventually that timer is going to hit zeros. Mm -hmm. So if you can reduce the amount of time you're spending flipping through the handbook or the codes and standards, the more time you have on actually reading and answering the questions. Um, so that's some great advice. So, you know, it, Here's a question, and this applies to anything that's turned closed book, whether it's, you know, a college exam, a high school exam, or or now the PE civil. And if you can kind of think back, going back to college, Luis, and you ever have a professor say, hey, we're going to have a open book exam today. Did that ever happen? From what I remember, we were allowed, for some class, we were allowed to have either a summary, like a one-sheet summary of the questions, concepts, anything mm -hmm. we wanted. There were a handful of classes where we actually could have like the book and everything mm -hmm. open. But like you were saying, you, you need to know what the material is within the book. You need to know the material. You need to have learn how to apply the material Correct. so you're not flipping through pages trying to find a similar problem because the, the, the exam is going to be over before you know it. So Correct. knowing the material is probably more important than if the exam is open book or closed book. And having an open book, obviously as engineers, I have my steel manual, I have my codes, everything here on my desk all the time when I'm answering problems and, and mm -hmm. finding solutions. But I need to know how to apply the code. I need to find the limitations. I need to know how everything kind of comes together. If I don't know that, I'm going to spend hours on end looking for the answer that uh, it may not be as obvious. No, you're absolutely right. And great background you gave. And the reason why I brought that up is, so one of the questions I get a lot is, is the exam going to be more difficult now that it's closed book or more, or is it going to be easier? And I always tell people, you know, whenever, if I can remember going back to my college days, I actually found that open book exams were a little bit more difficult because one professor's like, Hey, you have access to everything. And, but two is like, you are, you're like, okay, I don't maybe need to study as hard because I have the book, but mm -hmm. you're right. If you're spending all this time flipping through the book, your time is done. Yeah. So I don't know if there's a good answer or not, but I'll ask you, you know, do you think that there's a uh, advantages or disadvantages of the exam going CBT? Again, I, I think it depends on on the individual person. Like I personally think it's great because you are able to search for different things in the handbook. Um, again, you need to be conscious of the amount of time you're studying before the exam making sure you understand the concept, making sure we, what you're looking for when you search, because mm -hmm. you can search for a concept, but they it may throw you in a different part of the code that doesn't really apply to the question you're answering. But it may look from how they're ask, asking the question that it applies, and then you answer that way and it's wrong. So it's more of understanding where the mm -hmm. concepts fit within the question they're asking you and knowing what, what all is in that handbook, what all is in the code, and just finding the right section. I, in, in my case, I think that's, it's a positive thing that you can search for this. It's a positive thing that you can have all the materials in one place. And, and yeah. again, you need to be conscious of actually learning the material, knowing what everything is. For other people, they may just say, okay, everything is there. I, just, I can just search it. So I'm not going to study right. that hard. So for them, it's actually a downside that you have 
that search functionality and and having um to, to having all the material at the disposal of just a command f so no that, that makes sense um because like even if let, let's say you're searching for the word geometrics mm -hmm. it might pull up 40 results and if you have no clue what you're looking about for is you're gonna be like wasting your time going through 40 different results so i don't think people should prepare any less because just because you have a search function or whatever doesn't mean it's going to be easier yeah. to find this stuff if you don't know what you're looking for so I know, Louisa, you talk to people, you help people, kind of guide and mentor people um, as, as preparing for FE or PE. Have you had anyone reach out to you that had questions about the computer based and what kind of experience? And if you have, what are some of the most common questions that you fielded? Yeah, so there's been a few people that have uh, just reached out. I, I'm very active on LinkedIn and I like helping students. I have a few guides and everything that um, people download and and sound like they've been helpful. But I think one of the main questions is, is just kind of that open-ended question, like what's different about the CBT exam? Like what's new, what's different? Um, I actually pull 10 different things that change from the paper and pencil exam into the CBT and just put it on my website. So I usually redirect, redirect people to that. But again, it's just kind of what change. Um, I think the big one is like, what do I do about like the resources, the code? Like, do I need to bring a suitcase, especially for the structural part? We have we have so many codes. Do I still need to bring all those books? Uh, do we like what can I bring to the testing center? I think it's also a big one mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like snacks, water. Can I bring my phone, my watch? Uh, there's a lot of different logistical things around the P exam in general that not a lot of people realize, and they actually are a month away from taking the exam. Like mm -hmm. for me, I just went to Walmart and got a $8 watch because I couldn't bring my smartwatch to the testing center. And I think that's important to know how much time you have left. Yep. Usually they have a, ton, uh, a watch on the wall, but sometimes they don't. So little things like that, I think people don't realize until they actually start looking into, okay, what do I need to do to prepare for the exam? A lot of people have the technical side, whatever depth version, the portion they are taking on the control, they have courses, they have all of that stuff. But is that before you actually get into the exam, how do they prepare? How do mm -hmm. they approach exam? I think that's this is one of the most common questions I get for sure. No, that's that's very helpful. And you're you know, you're right, because you want to know what you're walking into, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you know you put together a plan and you get to the exam uh, testing center and all of a sudden they're like, well, you can't take this. You can't have that. So now what you have prepared for is changed. So, yeah. you, you know, people can panic, um, kind of lose their focus. So I think it's very important for everyone to have an understanding of what is allowed in the testing center and what they can bring. That way there's no surprises. You don't want any last minute surprises, right? Mm -hmm. You've worked hard preparing for the exam. You don't want something to come up and kind of, you know, put a hurdle in your direction. So, no, that's some great advice, Luis. Yeah. And um, just to add to that, if I, if I, if I may. Sure. Uh, Practicing the way you're going to take the exam, I think, is super important. Like little things make a huge difference. For me, I took three full day exams the same way. Mm -hmm. I, I got to the office, I, I drove on Saturday to the office, took the exam from eight to noon, took an hour lunch, and then exam from one to five, and really focused on actually putting myself in that situation. And little things like, what chair are you sitting on? The chair at the testing center may not be super comfortable. Is it going to be a wood chair? Are you going to be uncomfortable all morning? How are you going to feel as soon as, as you eat lunch and maybe you're a little tired? Do you need some coffee in the afternoon? Do you have access to those things? So those little things make a huge difference. And obviously coming from just an athletic background, the way you practice should be the way you are competing. So practice in the same situations, only have your pen. And if you're taking online, obviously maybe you're just computer, but you just focus on that browser. Um, things like snacks maybe different water when are you gonna go to the bathroom for me i just found like at that 12 hour mark i would just step away for 50 minutes get my get my thoughts back together and just go back but again but i practice all of these things three times before i actually took the exam so maybe sound a little um ridiculous when you first think about it but if you do all these things and you have everything under control you're gonna see on the exam and you're gonna feel right at home like if you sitting on your own chair and you're going to feel more confident when you go through all those questions. 
No, I mean, I, I think that's excellent. You know, and you're absolutely right. The way you practice is the way you're going to play. I remember when I was younger and, you know, my, we'd be at basketball practice. My dad would be like, don't take shots that you're not going to take during the game, right? Yeah. Don't learn bad habits because they're going to transition over into the game. But, no, you're absolutely right. Um, you want to kind of condition yourself for that marathon, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to practice things that you're not able to do during the actual exam because that's going to throw you off. So, no, I agree. Right. I always tell students, too, is, you know, I understand that it's difficult sometimes to find an eight hour slot, right? To kind of mm -hmm. go through that whole walk through an exam experience. But I always tell people it's essential. Practice it. That way you can get an idea of how to manage the time or, you know, like, oh man, I only, you know, I only got through, you know, 70 questions instead of the 80 because I ran out of time. So you need to learn these things. So I think mm -hmm. it's very important to practice um, and prepare that way. You know, you know, granted the questions that you're practicing on are not questions you're going to come across on the exam, but yeah. at least you can train yourself for that day and be ready for it. So I think that's excellent, Luis. Um, well, you know, I'm looking through the questions today and looking at some recommended study materials. And I see that you, uh, you have an ultimate PE exam study guide. What the heck is it? And if you want, <laughs> talk about it. Yeah. So again, taking the exam last year, I started creating a lot more content about the PE exam. How do I prepare? What are the best ways to prepare for the exam? So I, I put up a few guides, a free guide for the PE exam out. I think over 200 people have downloaded so far. I put my notes that I created for a summary of all the structural debt portion. Over a thousand people have downloaded that. So there's definitely a lot of people that are really looking for this kind of information, for this kind of uh, material. What I wanted to do was supplement what other people are doing, like what School of P is doing, providing the technical materials and help students, help engineers study for those materials. So I'm not teaching any of the technical stuff. I'm not going into how to calculate stresses for a beam, how to uh, calculate this hydrostatic pressure of a pipe. None of that stuff is really covering the exam. It's more of how do you learn, helping you identify your learning style, helping you with your time management, and helping you create that plan to hopefully pass the exam in the first try. My, my goal is to have this experience with people the same way I did it. I didn't sacrifice spending time with my family. I didn't sacrifice spending time with my friends during these studying sessions because I spread it out for four or five months. Mm -hmm. And we teach a lot of the learning techniques in, in the course that are going to help you learn a lot faster and obviously not sacrificing your life while you start with the exam. This is the first thing you hear when you say, I'm going to start preparing for the exam. Everyone is like, you are need to, you're going to have to sacrifice so much. You're going to have to put a lot of work. But in reality, if you're smart about it, if you use the time wisely, if you study the right things, using the right techniques to help you learn faster, you don't need to sacrifice a lot of these things. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort from your end. You need to be conscious of the time you put into study. But if you follow these things, if you follow these techniques, you're going to have a great time during these study sessions. That's pretty cool. And, you know, you bring up a good point. You know, a lot of times people talk about the sacrifices they have to make. And I'm not just talking about PE or FE exam. You know, people getting ready to go to med school or pass, yeah. the, take their tests for their boards. They're always talking about a sacrifice, but they're also making the whole, you know, preparing for the exam seem like a miserable experience. But I agree with you. If you plan it properly, it doesn't have to be something that you're dreading. Mm -hmm. I've actually found that if you can create a plan that is well thought out and if you can execute it you can actually make it a pretty enjoyable experience to where you're not missing out on things or you're not you know beating yourself up over the head because you're preparing for this exam so no i i think that's pretty cool luis um you know one question i see here and, and i hear it too is you know you know what you have the exam specs right mm -hmm. so you know what topics are going to be in the exam but that doesn't necessarily translate into how you should be studying, right? So is there a difference between how you should study in or st how to study as opposed to what you should study? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's certain things, kind of what we we're talking about before of the different type of questions you have now. So one of the things we teach in the course is just learning your your learning style. So there are visual, there's auditory, there's uh, reading and writing, and there's that kinesthetic uh, learning style, which is more hands-on. So studying for for any part of the exam using those learning styles. So for me, I like to write and I like to read. So if I use those techniques and I'm going to create summaries and I'm going to create resources and then apply some of the other 
uh, just learning techniques like space repetition, these other techniques that are going to help you learn a lot faster, you're going to be able to get a, a better sense of what's in the exam. And then what I liked, what I did when I was taking, when I was studying for the exam was, okay, within these structure sections, which are the sections with 10 questions in a section? Which one is the one with two questions? Obviously, the, I study more for the ones that are 10 questions within a section because I, there's a higher chance I'm going to have yep. those questions. The other ones are, okay, I need to study. I need to know what's going on. But if you focus on studying smart and studying what you need to study and study what maybe is not as fresh in your mind, you're going to make the most out of that time as well as just seeing how different topics, different questions, different things kind of connect with each other. Because I feel like, 50% of the exam is just knowing where to look in your brain for an answer for the question. The technical side is not super complicated. The formulas are not super complicated, but it's tricky to know where to start with the problem. Do you need to know multiple background informations in order to answer a single question? So it kind of depends. I focus a lot more on those kind of higher end number of questions within the structural depth portion. Again, like I said, I focus probably 80, 90% of my time starting for the depth portion. No, that makes sense. And I appreciate you sharing that. So as I know, we're kind of getting to the end of the, the podcast for the day. So let me ask you this. So everyone's looking for, I don't know, maybe hints or tips, mm -hmm. or sometimes you're looking for a, a hack to try to get through the PE civil exam. So what are some of your favorite hacks for passing the PE civil exam? So I think one of the best ones, and it's a simple one, I think a lot of people have said this in in everything that I that I have seen to just to take the exam is, when you take the exam, obviously you can fast forward through questions and answer the ones you you know first. Mm -hmm. Then go back and do a second pass in maybe like the second tier and then go back and do like the last pass. Because if you answer the most questions right away, you're going to have a higher motivation. You're going to feel better about yourself. Yep. And then you start going through the other questions the harder. Obviously the hardest one towards the end, maybe you don't have time. Maybe you're just able to guess at the end. You don't get deducted any points for having a wrong answer. So yep. there's no harm on, on just getting those towards the end. But I think that's it's a simple, basic one. And in terms of, of preparing, I think the best advice is just start early. If you can, four months, I think, is, is the minimum. Again, you don't need to study 20 hours a day or, or 40, 50, 60 hours a week to pass the exam. You just need to be smart about it, space it out, and you're going to be fine at the end of the day. I agree. I, I, you know, work, uh, what is it? Work smarter, not harder. Yep. Um, but no, I, I agree. The, um, you know, when, you know, I talk to people about, you know, when they're getting ready to take their PMP exam for project managers. And I'm like, you know, when you go through the exam, grab the low hanging fruit first, right? Mm -hmm. As you say, it builds some confidence, but plus you're getting those out of the way because what, you know, it would really be horrible if let's say you've spent the 95% of the time and you got like, let's say 10 questions or 12 questions left. And you're like, oh man, I'm running out of time. But these questions were easy, but you didn't mm -hmm. get to them because you were struggling to answer some of the more difficult questions earlier on in the exam. Yeah. So you leave some points on the board there. Agree. Don't leave a blank answer, right? There is no penalty for an incorrect answer or yeah. So incorrect answer. So put an answer for everything. So, so Luis, you know, I appreciate you come back out here today. Love to have you back. Any words of wisdom you want to share to the audience as the summer comes to an end? I think it's 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 a great time to kind of get back into that learning routine. I think this summer, a lot of people don't like to study. I didn't study during the summer. I took it in April. But as, as we come out of the summer, the winter, I think those are my favorite times of, yep. of study, of learning. You're kind of in the house and it's, maybe it's a little cozy. You have a blanket on you and you just kind of focus on studying. But uh, just in terms of the exam, I think a lot of people have that fear that it's a tough exam. It's it's hard. You have to study a lot. You have to put this many hours into it. You need to sacrifice all these things. But what I'm trying to do with my content is show the opposite. Like if you know how to study, if you know where to study, it doesn't have to be that hard. You can have a, a semi-regular life as you prepare for the exam. And at the end of the day, I think you're going to be fine. If you don't pass the first time, that's fine. Like a lot of people don't. Most people I talk to, they haven't passed it the first time. I, I don't remember the last time I asked my supervisor or a coworker, like, oh, did you pass the P exam the first time? Because if you didn't, I don't think you're a good engineer. Like that's right. not the whole point. Prepare well, stay calm, and just put the best effort and, and you're going to be fine. I 100% agree with you, Luis. Um, you know, it's kind of like, let's say you're a doctor. 
And uh, let's say you just made it through med school. Maybe you're a C minus student or whatever, but you go, you pass your board, you're a doctor. No one's going to ask you like, hey, Luis, what were your grades in med school, right? Right. So same thing here. Um, but the best thing about this is if you don't pass the exam, you're not having to wait six months to retake it. Get back on that That's horse right. and, uh, you know, ride, ride. So, hey, Luis, <laughs> thanks again for coming out. Everyone out there, have a wonderful rest of your week. And Luis, love to have you back here again. But again, you know, thanks for coming back for round two. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. All right, everyone out there, have a wonderful day.